today. Uh, let me just, let me just uh, pray very quickly. Lord, open our eyes to see something new today. Open our ears to hear something new today. And more importantly, Lord, let us fall more and more in love with Jesus and understand how much you love us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you've got a, a collection of ancient documents there in front of you, you might want to turn to Luke chapter 15 this morning. Uh, you know, many, many years ago, I had a cat. And my cat's name was Tiger. Tiger was a grey, sort of a you know, normal sort of a house cat thing. I was living in Mudsey with my, my dad at the time. And Tiger was the toughest cat in, in town, long story short. He was, he was a brawler. He would, every night he'd go out the door and you'd hear him in the street attacking other cats. He'd, ta- he'd attack dogs, uh, kangaroos. I reckon he broke into a few houses. He was that mean. Uh, stole a couple of cars. We'd come out the front. Where did that come from? Uh, all sorts of things. He was just a tough cat. One night he got into a, a battle with about six cats. They cornered him in an alleyway and they jumped him. It was a bullying type of a situation. They slashed at him and they actually ripped his eye out. Ooh, the whole tone changed just then, didn't it? From ha <laughs> ooh. Anyway, moving on. I didn't think about the animal lovers might have been impacted by that one. My apologies. Um, and I too am an animal lover. But what ended up happening was uh, we took uh, Tiger to the vet and the vet sort of stitched up the eye. And then because of the sort of state of the way I, I, me and my dad, we were living together in Mudsy, and because of the, the situation we we're in financially, we couldn't afford to go back to the vet and take the stitches out, because that would mean back in those days you have to pay the vet. So unfortunately, we never went back, and Tiger lived with the rest of his life with stitches in his eye. Um, but don't judge us for it. We, we, we love the cat, um, just couldn't afford to pay the vet bill. And so anyway, here's what happened. A long, time, long story short, years later, I ended up leaving um, Mudgee. I, I couldn't live with my mother and my father, so I ended up on a, 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 a train, uh, and a bus going from Mudgee over the Blue Mountains through Lithgow down to St Mary's where my nan was and I was stopped at my nan's place for overnight then jumped in a bus and a series of trains the next day and that's how I ended up up on the north coast of New South Wales. I moved in with an uncle and an auntie of mine. But uh, on the way when I left, <coughs> uh, when, when I left, obviously I left my cat and everything behind, uh, one day I went back to uh, Mudgee. I can't remember how I ended up back there but I went back down to Mudgee uh, I was driving through to visit some friends or something. No, I wasn't driving through. I went to visit my dad. That's right. And um, my, my dad wasn't there. Sorry. I'm trying to think how I ended up in Mudgee. I can't remember how I ended up there. That's right. Now, when I, when I left Mudgee, I took the cat. That's right. It's just all coming back to me now. When I left Mudgee, I took Tiger with me in a cage. So what I did is, uh, in a bag, sorry, I smuggled him in a bag and I managed to get him on the train and nobody noticed. And then I had to get off the train onto a bus and I kept him in a little bag and nobody noticed. And I got him all the way to St. Mary's. When I got to St. Mary's, I put him in a bag and tried to take him to the bus station the next day to go up. And the bus driver recognised, there's something moving in that bag of yours. So he opened up the bag and he saw it was a cat. He said, son, you can't take this. So my pop said, give it, back, give it to me. I'll take him home. I'll put him in a cage and I'll see what I can do about getting him up to you. So my pop took him. I got on the bus, came up. When I got up here, my pop ended up ringing me and saying, the cat overnight went absolutely ballistic. He literally tore the cage to shreds, got out, and I'm sorry, he's gone. So Tiger's gone. Anyway, a couple of years later, I found myself going through Mudgee. I was driving through Mudgee. It'd be four or five years later. And I knocked on the door of a mate of mine that used to live a few doors up from me, and he wasn't there. He'd left town, but his mum was there. And his mum said, oh, did you know that Tiger's still running around? This is Mudgee. This is like several hundred kilometres from St Mary's where I had the cat in the cage. He's climbed over the hills and gone all the way back to, to Mudgee. And I said, no, why well, couldn't be him because I took him. She said, no, it's him because he's got the stitches and that. So I went and stood in the middle of the street and I called out, Tiger, Tiger. And sure enough, Tiger came running to me. He'd somehow found his way back home over two, three hundred kilometres over the, the, the range and everything through Katoomba and through the cold and the ice. and so. I mean, someone should make a movie really, about my cat. Spielberg should be listening, make a movie about my cat, just call it Tiger. Um, I'm saying all that, I'm saying all that to say this, wouldn't it be great if in the Bible, God compared us to cats? Who thought about that? But we get compared to this other animal called sheep, don't we? We we get compared to this animal called sheep. Now, if anyone knows anything about sheep, they are dim-witted, they are silly, they are easily led, They're not the most intelligent creatures, but for some reason, we get referred to by God Almighty as sheep. I would have rather been a cat. You know, we all like cats have gone astray. I would have said, no, cats don't go astray. Cats find their way home. Cats cats, cats are cool animals. You've got to work hard to get the affection of a cat. Anyone know that? Dogs, I love dogs, but dogs are easy to win over. You just give them a bone or something and they're your best mate. Cats, you've really got to work hard to get the respect of a cat. But for some reason, we are referred to quite often in 
these ancient documents as sheep, that God sees us as sheep. And I want to share a little bit about a story that you have probably read a million times this morning about a lost sheep. A lost sheep. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus is speaking and he begins to share a series of parables. There's actually three parables that he's going to share here that Luke groups together and records in Luke 15. It goes something like this. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. I find that really interesting because I reckon that goes on every Sunday all around the world. It says the tax gatherers and those people, they actually came. What did they come to do? They actually came to listen. Jesus, we want to hear from you. We want to know what you've got to say. But there was another group of people in that crowd too who apparently already knew God. And what did they do? They spent the whole time what? Just muttering. Whinging, complaining, you know? I want to be more, I guess, like the tax collectors and the sinners, if I'm allowed to say that without people stoning me, because they were more open to what Jesus had to say, because they knew something about themselves. They probably knew that they didn't have it all together, probably knew they had a way to go. So anyway, these Pharisees and teachers of the law muttering. And then Jesus, and they, they're muttering this, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus tells them this parable. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses just one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Don't mistake what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that there's 99 who don't need to repent. That's not his point. Think about who he's talking to. He's talking to tax collectors and sinners, but he's talking to the Pharisees who are muttering, who feel like they've got it all together. So he's kind of a little bit, I guess you could say, tongue-in-cheek maybe saying, look, there's more rejoicing over that one humble person who acknowledges their need for God and, and, and listens to God and wants God as opposed to the group of you standing here listening to me who feel like you don't need to. That's the point that he's making. He's not saying that some don't. We all need to repent. We're all in need of God, amen? Every single one of us. You see, sheep are not the most prestigious animals for God to compare us to. They are dim-witted. They're easily distracted and they're prone to wandering off into dangerous, dangerous areas. Charles Spurgeon said this once about sheep. He said, a sheep is, of all creatures, most senseless. Thank you, Jesus. If we have a lost dog, it may find its way home again. Possibly a horse might return to its master's stable, but a sheep will wander on and on in endless mazes lost. Hallelujah, we are sheep. How awesome is that? I was listening to a guy called Skip, a pastor called Skip Heitzig. Uh, this week, he, he pastors Calvary Chapel there in the States, and he was quoting a, a, a philosophy professor who made this comment about sheep once. He said, the existence of sheep is evidence against the theory of evolution. <laughs> if evolution were true, there's just no way sheep could have survived. In other words, if evolution, survival of the fittest and the fastest and the smartest, he said, if evolution is true, sheep are so dim-witted and, and can't look, there's no way on planet Earth evolution can be true. And if anyone ever says to you, I believe in evolution, I want you to bring up on images a picture of a sheep and go, explain, please. According to the theory of evolution, an animal so dim-witted, easily led, easily wandering off and lost, there's no way that that thing should still be around. So sheep are not the greatest thing for us to be compared to, but... God compares us to sheep, doesn't he? Isaiah 53, 6. It says, we all. Everybody say, we all. We all. That means you. That means me. We all. Every one of us, like sheep, here we are again, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, speaking of Jesus, the iniquity of us all, which is what we were just talking about with the cross, that the things that we've done wrong, that, that Jesus took that punishment upon himself. But we're all like sheep, and we all go our own way like sheep. It's, what's interesting about sheep is when a sheep wanders off, you know, it's not the shepherd's fault that a sheep wanders off. Anyone know that? You can't blame the shepherd because the sheep decided to wander off. I know we live in a world where God gets to blame for everything. Everything's God's fault. Even if you don't believe in God, when something goes wrong, all of a sudden you do, and it's God's fault for everything. But when a sheep chooses to wander off, it's not the shepherd's fault. The shepherd's doing everything he can to lead them sheep down a good path. He's doing everything he can to take them sheep to a great place, a place that's good for them because he cares for the sheep, because he loves the sheep, because he nurtures the sheep. 
He treats the sheep like they're his own family. Jeremiah 50 verse 6 says, My people have been lost sheep. In this situation, he says, Their shepherds have led them astray and caused them to roam on the mountains. The shepherds have led them astray, but they're still sheep. We've been led astray. They've wandered over mountains and hills and forgot their own resting place. See, we're compared to sheep over and over again. And in this particular parable, we've got a story of a sheep that has gone astray. And Jesus says to the crowd, he says, which one of you, if you were that shepherd, and one sheep wanders off, which one of you would not turn his attention towards that one and go looking after and looking for that one sheep? So what Luke's emphasizing here in this story is that how Jesus deliberately pursued and focused on lost things. And then to back it up, he tells two more parables, doesn't he? The next one's the parable of a lost coin. And he talks about a woman that loses a coin and then she just forgets the other nine for a minute and focuses all her energy and attention on the one coin that was lost, searches for her. When she finds it, what does she do? So she calls her friends and neighbours and celebrates with them. Economically, that makes no sense. Probably costs more to throw the party than it did for the coin. And then it rolls into a third parable about a lost son. A lost son. A son who took his father's, uh, uh, took his inheritance early, uh, if you understand the culture of that, completely wrong, everything that the son did. But even though the father was so ill-treated, he waited each day and wanted the son to come back. And we all know the story. When the son came back, he'd rehearsed his speech. He didn't even wait for the speech. He just ran down the road to the son, hugged the son, restored the son, and so on. See, Jesus, uh, these parables are speaking about God's decision to deliberately pursue and focus on things that are lost. Anyone here ever lost a child in a crowd? Anyone? Yeah? Yeah? Anyone ever lost a child in a crowd? Anyone got more than one child and lost a child in a crowd? Yep. And what do you do in that moment? I'll tell you what you do in that moment. You might, you, you don't sit there and you don't turn to your partner, to your husband, to your wife and go, well, that, one of our kids is missing. Oh, but it's okay, we've still got three others, don't worry about it. That's no, okay. It's only one. We've still got the majority of them here. Don't panic. It's all good. Let's keep going. Now, what do you do in that moment? Your focus changes, doesn't it? And your focus and attention is directed toward the one that's lost. And part of what Luke's talking about here and what Jesus is revealing through these parables is that not only do us as humans have a tendency to focus in on that which is lost, but God also has a heart that focuses in on that which was lost. Think about it. If God wasn't focusing in on that which was lost, why Jesus? Because we were lost. And so Jesus comes because God looks down and God goes, they're lost. They're lost. God has this amazing capacity to want to focus in on lost things. Now, none of what I just told you in this parable so far is probably a new thought for you. Amen? It's probably what you've heard a thousand times and it's what you know. God's focused on the lost. God cares about the lost. 100% true. But now what I want to do is I want you to hear what Jesus' audience probably heard when Jesus said this parable to them. See, when Jesus says, which one of you, if you have a hundred sheep and one wanders off, would not leave the 99 to chase the one? You know what they would have collectively said? None of us. None of us. You don't do that. Uh, there, there's a guy by the name of Dave Adamson, and he does a lot of online stuff for churches around the world. Uh, you might know him if you want to find him. He's Aussie Dave. You can find him. He's called Aussie Dave. And we were at a conference a number of years back, and this is where this thought was kind of planted in my mind. We were at a conference, and he was sharing how he went over to Israel, and he, was, he decided to hook himself up with a Bedouin shepherd who had a herd of sheep and he was shepherding them around the, 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 the wilderness, the pastures, whatever, of Israel. And he, he got to spend a day or two with this guy as he shepherded the sheep. And you know, the sheep would follow him. He would make a noise and, and the sheep knew his voice. Remember that passage where Jesus says, my sheep know me, my sheep know my voice? Remember that? It, it's, it's the same imagery. The shepherd speaks. That group of sheep, they know that voice. So they follow after that voice. And he said what was interesting was he, was, he would, would talk and mutter and the sheep would follow him across the plains and up and down around. He said he got to a hill at one point and he started to walk up this hill. And all the sheep started going with him. But one sheep decided at the base of the hill, this is too hard. And so the sheep just sat down and didn't move. And so Dave sat there and he said, this passage came to my mind. Which one of you, among you, if you lose one sheep, will not come back 
and get the one and leave the 99. And you know what the shepherd did? He kept walking. He left that sheep sitting there and he just kept on walking. And in that moment, that image of what we think of, oh, you know, the sheep would leave, that image was shattered. Because back in those days, a shepherd would not leave 99 and go and chase after the one. Because all of a sudden, another one of those sheep would become the leader of that sheep. In 2006, I don't know if you're aware of this little, little fact, in 2006 in East Turkey, a weird thing happened. There was a herd of about 400 sheep just sort of hanging together. One of those sheep decided that he would wander off in that direction towards a ravine that was 15 metres deep and thought he'd try to jump over it. Well, he walks off, gets to the edge, goes to jump, of course can't jump very far, and falls 15 metres to his death. But what was weird about it was another sheep looked up and went, oh, he's going there, I'll do that too. So he walked over and did it too. And another one saw it and went, well, that's what we're doing, we'll go and do that too. He walked over and did it as well. 400 sheep jumped off that cliff and fell 15 feet and killed themselves because they're all following somebody. They're all following somebody. Again, how dim did a sheep? Well, there you go. There you go. So when we hear this story, we hear this uh, picture of, of the, the heart of the shepherd and the love for the sheep, and that's all true. But what they would have thought straight away is what you're saying, Jesus, is illogical. It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. Number one, if you lose a sheep, you don't sacrifice, potentially sacrifice the 99 by turning your back on them and neglecting them and going over here. You don't do that. Wolves could come on in. Bandits could come and You don't turn your back on them. You count your losses and you go, hey, I've got 99 more, and you just keep on going. If you lose a coin, you don't clean the house and, 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 and find that coin and then throw a party that could potentially cost more than the price of the coin. You'd be financially better off just going, oh, I've got nine coins still, just look after them and don't drop them through the cracks. If you're the father in the story of the prodigal son and you've been humiliated and culturally made to look stupid and you've probably got people in your culture looking at you as a father going, what are you doing? You should be disciplining your son. You should be do- handling this differently. Don't, it's not just about the son in that story. The father would have been copping a lot of grief too because what he did was illogical. It was illogical to just let the son go and do that. And it was illogical to just let that son come back and restore him as if he'd never done it in the first. It's illogical. The love of God is illogical. And what these people would have heard at that moment was, no, Jesus, you don't leave the 99. This is illogical what you're talking about. Now, here's the thing. I wonder, because quite often the Bible refers to us as sheep. We know that. And we also know the shepherd is... Who's the good shepherd? Jesus is the good shepherd. And we see this throughout the New Testament as well, this reference to to God being the shepherd and Jesus the good shepherd and we being the sheep of the fold. There's this imagery of the church. And so I wonder when Jesus is saying this, which one of you, if you've got 100 and you lose one, the only way it would logically make sense to leave the 99 and go after the one is if the 99 are caring for each other. If the 99 are looking out for each other. If the 99 are watching each other's back. See, sheep, sheep are actually made for community. It's true. If you want to study some of the better aspects of sheep, sheep are very communal creatures. Um, sheep get depressed when they're isolated. Did you know that? They've done studies, and sheep struggle with depression when they isolate themselves from a herd. They're created to be in community. They're created to be together. Sheep get distressed when another sheep that they have a relationship with passes away. They have emotional struggles, you know? Sheep are known to to emotionally struggle because they build certain connections, deeper connections with certain sheep in the herd. They they know all the sheep in the herd, but they build certain depth of connection with certain sheep in a herd, just like you do in a church. We can know everybody, but of course, we're going to have different depths and levels of relationship, aren't we? With each other as we get to know each other and so on. But but the point is this, that, that as a herd... I can understand what Jesus is saying if he's talking about the church. The shepherd can go and put his focus on that which is lost because I know that the sheep are going to care for one another. Did you know in the New Testament there are over 60 passages that say we should one another, one another? There's over 60 verses in the New Testament that talk about how you and I should be one anothering one another. In, in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus said this, right? Jesus said, a new command I give you, 
Right? This is a new command. He said, here's my command. Love who? Love one another. Love one another. And not just love one another however you seem fit. I'll let you determine the parameters of what it means to love one another. I'll let you make it up. I'll let you work it out. He says, no, no, no. I'm not just telling you what you should do, but I'm actually going to show you how you do that. I'm going to show you how you do that. He says, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this will everyone know you're my disciples if you are vocal about all the things that you hate in your community. He doesn't say that, does he? The world's going to know that you're my disciples if you just make sure that on social media you're attacking everyone that thinks differently to you or anyone that does a thumbs up emoji to something that might be ungodly. You make sure you go after them and by this they're going to know. They're going to know that you're my follower. he, He didn't say that. Now, if you come to a religious meeting every Sunday, like every seven days you walk into a building, they're going to know. Now, is it good to speak out against things that are ungodly? Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Is it good to come to a gathering every week? Yep, I would highly encourage it. Stay connected. Come along. Be a part of a, a fellowship. Go together somewhere. with. I encourage it. There's nothing wrong with it. What about just because you run around telling everyone how good Jesus is? Why this they will know. He didn't, he didn't say any of those things. And I think it's great that we run around telling people how good Jesus is. But it's amazing from Jesus' perspective, he said, if you really want people to know that you're a follower of mine, here's, here's the thing, then love other followers. Love other followers. There's a lot of things we're told to one another, isn't there? There's a lot of things we weren't told to one another as well, like, you know, criticize one another, poke holes in one another, ridicule one another, place yourself above one another. There's a lot of one another's we're not meant to do, but there's a lot of one another's we are. There's about 60 in the New Testament. And when Jesus says here that love one another as I've loved you, I think the 60 one another's are then the flesh of, okay, so what does it actually look like to love one another? What does it look like for us to actually love one another? Because here's, here's what I think the church needs to look like. The church needs to reflect Jesus. And here's how I think Jesus wants us to reflect him. We need to maintain a focus on that which is lost without neglecting that which is found. And how does Jesus maintain a focus on that which is lost without neglecting that which is found? Well, I think in this parable, we got a little bit of a picture. He can focus on that which is lost if the 99 are actually caring for, loving one another and one another in one another and being the church to one another and being disciples to one another. If we're doing that to one another, then the shepherd is able to go and focus on the lost. I think that's part of the point of what Jesus is trying to say. The crowd said they went, this is illogical because they're thinking about sheep and a shepherd. But I'm looking at the bigger picture going, I think Jesus was talking about more than just natural shepherd and natural sheep. I think he's talking about the church. We need to have a focus on that which is lost without neglecting that which is found. And churches can fall into both extremes, can't we? We can do it. Even in our own personal world, we can fall into both extremes. We can get so gun-ho about that which is lost that we don't care about that which is found. We don't want another one another. We're not interested in it. And we can think that God's all for that. Well, yeah, God's for that, but that's half the story. But then there are other churches that get very inward-focused and believers who get very introspected. All I care about is going to Bible studies and prayer meetings and everything I do is in the church and I don't care about what's going on out there in the world. I don't care about my neighbor that doesn't know Jesus or my kids that aren't walking with God or the people that work or nothing. It's, it's, I don't care. I've got my little life in here and we can totally neglect. And I think God's into that. We need to one another. Um, he's into that. But there's a balance to it. There's a balance to it. And I think we need to learn to find that balance as a church. We need to find that balance as individuals. We need to have a focus on that which is lost. I wonder if I threw this out there without any raised hands whatsoever. I wonder if I asked this question of each person in this room. In the last seven days, have you lifted up one single person that does not know Jesus to God in prayer? Have you lifted up one person that doesn't know Jesus to God in prayer? Just a question. How, how, how much attention or how much of a focus do we have as individuals on a world that if we believe this set of ancient documents is not going to a good place? Not going to a good place. I wonder how much time we spend praying for those that don't know Jesus, praying for opportunities maybe to share. 
or just praying, God, you do the God stuff in their world. I don't even, that doesn't even have to be me. It could be somebody else, Lord. Bring across their path. We've got to learn how to have a focus as Jesus did. We focus on that which is lost, but we can't afford to neglect that which is found. In Luke 15, the last parable of this group, it's really interesting play between... So it's almost like you've got this parable of the lost sheep that takes place outside of the house. Then you've got the parable of a lost coin which took place inside of a house. Then you've got a parable of the lost son and we've got this picture of a son outside of the house and a son inside of the house. It's almost like the third parable kind of brings the best points of the first two and ties them in together. And in Luke 15... Verse 29 to 31, there's this little interplay between the father and the son who apparently is found. He's in the house. He says to his father, he says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. What an interesting perspective on his relationship with his father. I'm a slave and I just obey. It doesn't sound much like a father-son relationship. I think this son that didn't wander kind of still had wandered and didn't quite understand some things about relationship with his father. He saw himself as a slave. I'm just, everything you tell me to do, I do it, but I do it as a slave. Not as a son, not as a son, I'm a slave. And I obey everything, every command. Now, I guarantee he didn't. How many of you think he might have been a little bit unsure of his own shortcomings? No one's that perfect. But his attitude, all these years I've been slaving and never disobeyed you. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. And here's the father's response. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. The attitude of the found son towards his father. I'm slaving and I'm just simply obeying orders. He didn't understand who he was. He didn't understand that you are a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You are saved. You are, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You are in the house right now. You've made, if you die tomorrow, your, your, your fate is secured. Your fate is secured. But this brother of yours, he's, he's gone. He's out there. It's not so good for him at the moment. His attitude towards his father... Needed an adjustment. What about his attitude towards his brother? He doesn't even call him his brother, does he? He says, this son of yours, that's his brother. That's his brother. No compassion, no heart for this lost brother that's wandered out and made dumb choices and ruined his life. No compassion whatsoever. I'm slaving away for you and this son of yours. What a terrible attitude. Yet this guy apparently never wandered. He's apparently in the house. What a poor attitude for somebody that's still in the house. Now notice the father's response to him. He says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. In other words, let me bring a little perspective to you. If you're always with me, what does that mean? That means I'm always with you. I'm always with you. And all these promises, everything belongs to you. It's yours. It's already yours. But it was out of reach of this son who was lost. Should we not celebrate when that son who was lost come back? And is it not okay to have a bit of focus out there on that son? I'm not neglecting you. Because all I have is yours. How am I neglecting? I'm focused out here, but I'm not neglecting you. Everything I have is yours. And I'm with you. I'm here with you. But I'm... Looking out there for this lost son. I'm looking for this lost coin. I'm looking for this lost sheep. Jesus talks about having a focus on the lost without neglecting the found. And that's what we need to do as a church. We need to maintain a focus on lost things, lost people. It's interesting that Luke chooses to constantly use this terminology, lost and found. Other gospel writers, often the Pharisees didn't say lost, found. They said tax gatherer, sinner, prostitute, blah, blah, blah. And and, and Jesus sort of uses this lost, found. Lost, found, lost, found, lost, found. See, when we act like the mission of the church revolves around us, 
that the resources, the time, the energy of the church should be spent on us, we're not accurately reflecting the life and the teachings of Jesus, are we? We're not accurately reflecting the life and the teachings of Jesus. Often we want to be like that, son, don't we? We, just, we want a church that totally revolves around us and does everything for us, and it's all about us, and all the resources are spent on us, and all the energy is spent on all the time. And what we've got to do is find that balance as a community. How do we not neglect? One of the reasons why we're releasing connect groups is, is that's part of that one anothering one another, caring for one another, looking out for one another. Now, some people here, you're going to choose to connect yourself. We'll have more groups being released in the coming weeks. Some of you will choose to get into a connect group. That's fine. Some of you, statistically, will probably still choose to just not do it. You, 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 you'll still not want to do it. And that, that, look, that's okay. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying that's an opportunity where the church, where as a church, we're trying to say, here's how we can be like those 99 sheep and actually start to care for one another. Put some things in place so we can actually care for one another. The church needs to maintain a focus on the lost without neglecting the found. And that's why we need to get busy on the one another. In the coming weeks, I want to spend a bit of time. There's 60 one another's in the Bible. And the one another's are the meat. The one another's are, Jesus says, not just what we should do, love one another. And he says, here's how you do it. And he gives us these one another's that show us the practical side of how do we actually one another and be the church to each other. To kick the ball off, I'll leave you with one verse as we finish up today. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. This is the pastor's favorite verse to beat you over the head and make sure that you turn up at church every Sunday and I've seen it used to guilt people and all kinds of things. I want you to forget all that. I just want to explain something to you. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. God's faithful. And he says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Some people stopped gathering together for various reasons. Some because it was just too hard, the persecution, the pressure. They didn't want to be connected to the church. They didn't want to lose that. Whatever the reasons were, the writer does not give us all the reasons. But what we do know is some people had decided, I just don't want to stay connected anymore. I want to go back over here and, and either go back into old Judaistic practices or maybe not go, whatever it was, they didn't want to stay connected. And he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So usually when we hear this verse, we focus on the what. And we focus on the what and the what is, don't neglect gathering together. You better be here on Sunday. We'll be doing a roll call. We'll be giving you a phone call. We'll be calling you up, chasing you up, looking on social media to see if you did something Sunday morning. Better not post a photo of a barbecue at 10.30. We'll know where you were. You know? But that's not what he's saying. That's not what it's about. Here's what he's saying. He gives us the, the what, which is gather together, but then he gives us a why. Why do we want to gather together? Why do we want to be together? And here's the first of those one another's that we're going to start to look at over the coming weeks, coming months. He says, consider how you may spur one another on to love and good works. That word consider means fix your mind on. Again, let me ask you a question. This, is this okay? I'm, I'm asking you some questions today to think about. Let me ask you a question. Before you came here this morning, did you take any time to stop and think and say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to go and gather with 80, 100, whatever, however many come each week, 40 one week and 100 the next. I'm going to go and gather with that number of your children. And here's the thing. They are going to have needs and struggles and they're doing it tough and they've got this going on, that going on. Holy Spirit, when I get there this morning, I'm asking you, give me someone I can spur on, push on towards love and towards good works. Who's somebody there today, Lord, that I can encourage to keep walking the journey? Who's someone there that I can encourage to stick in there with Jesus? Who's someone there that I can encourage that, hey, pick yourself up. You might have had a fall this week. Wipe the dust off. God is with you. We love you. Let's go. Who's that person this morning, Lord, when I gather? Did, I wonder how many of us before we come here actually realize that when we come to church... There's a difference between community and a crowd, isn't there? And you see this in the Bible. There was the Jesus community that went with Jesus, but there was also a crowd that walked with Jesus. Amen? Massive crowd of people. But there was a very distinct difference between the crowd and the Jesus community. And the difference probably, I could probably sum it up this way. I think crowds are all, crowds are generally consumers and spectators. Crowds generally spectate and consume. I'm there to watch, that's it. And if there's something going I can have, I'll take it. That's what a crowd does. But in the Jesus community, we see 
different. We see community, Jesus' community members are not spectators and consumers. They're participants and contributors. They participate in what God is doing in that community. They participate with the Holy Spirit They spur one another on to love and good works. They encourage one another while ever the opportunity is there and today is today. And this is what it talks about. It's not just about gathering. We don't just gather so we can have a crowd on a Sunday morning. We gather, we hear the word of God. We do some worship together. But we're encouraging time and time again at the end of a service. Hey, why don't you talk, pray with one another? Why don't you, 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 something on your heart, go to that person. Because it doesn't kind of finish when I go, right, let's pray, it's over. The Holy Spirit's not going to the green room after that, having a sip of Coca-Cola going, oh, that was a tough one, but we got through it. Yeah. No, no. He's doing his stuff. And he wants to do it through his people, through a bunch of participants. Are we going to be here at Arise and be part of the crowd, or are we going to be part of the community? Because they're two very distinct, different things. If you just want to be a part of the crowd, that's fine. No dramas. You're welcome. I'm not saying you're not. What I'm saying now is the reason the shepherd can leave and go after the one is because the 99 are actually community, and they're caring for one another. And instead of following that stupid sheep that's about to jump down a 15-meter ravine, a couple of them are grabbing him by the wool, hair, wool, grabbing him by the wool and dragging him back and going, buddy, I just want to let you know that's a dumb idea. I don't think Jesus wants you jumping down that 15-foot ravine. Let's have a look at the word of God. Can we gather around? Let's pray for this sheep. Lay your claws on him. There's a difference between community and crowd. And when the writer says, don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves, he's speaking to people that want community. Why do we gather together? He says, because we've got a chance to spur one another on. In other words, we've got a chance to one another, one another. And you can either wait till we go through some of these one another's, or you can go home this week and flick open the New Testament and have a look at what those one another's are. And we can start one anothering one another, because I'm very convinced of this. There's a world out there, according to Jesus anyway, by this will they know, that look at Christians. And one of the things they're looking at, I think, is are you actually a Jesus-type community that are living Jesus and and treating one another and doing Jesus' life together, or is it just another crowd? Is it just a crowd? I want to rise to be a community that reflects Jesus' kind of life to one another. And you know, I know there are some people sitting here too, and you're probably like me. I, I look extroverted when I'm in front of a crowd. Oh, that's, that's a gift of God on my life. It's not my natural... I'm not naturally like that. I'm very much a... Put me in the backyard, you know, with a book, on a chair, and the rest of the world stay away from me, and I'm happy. That's the truth. It's weird. I'm not this... But you know what? I realise that I have to park that. That's just a part of me that I've got to park at times to engage myself in Jesus' community because that's not healthy for me to live in that space. And some of you here, you're probably very much like me. And my encouragement to you is it's not healthy to live in that space. I sacrifice that space for the sake of being a part of a Jesus community and getting around people because I need you. I need you to encourage me. I need you to spur me on to love and good works. I need you to, 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 to walk alongside of me. I need you to help me be a better father. I need you to help me be a better husband. I need you to help me be a better Jesus disciple. And whether you like it or not, you need me. And you need the people next to you. So I guess what I want to share, what, the point I want to make this morning is that we need to maintain a focus on that which is lost. But we can't afford to neglect that which is found. And if we get... The, the, the caring of one another right, then I believe that the great shepherd, you know what he does? He goes out and he finds lost and that's the kind of fold he wants to bring them into. He wants to bring them into a community where they're going to experience Jesus, where they're going to be loved the way Jesus wants them to be loved, where they're going to be discipled, not just we're going to chuck you in here, now we've saved you, now what? Oh, who cares? You're saved. You know? I think that's the kind of community that God is looking for. And not only God, I think that's what the world's looking for in the day and age we're living in. That's why without chucking all the little beginning bits there, you'll hear uh, people advocating for blah, blah, community. Ever notice they use that word? 
It's not just lifestyle, it's community. This community, that community. Because people want community, not just a crowd, amen? Lord, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for your word. God, for each person in this room, Lord, we, we are not... God, I, I, you're going to come back one day, that's a fact. I don't know whether I'll still be walking on two legs or not, but you will come back. And you've given us X amount of years on earth. I don't know whether I've got another one, another 10, another 30, 40, I don't know. But I do know that I have this moment now. I do know I have this season now, God. And I just pray for each person in this room that, Lord, we would, uh, God, make the most of the time that we have. That, Lord, we would learn in our own way how do we maintain a focus on lost things. God, how do we put ourselves in a place where you can use us to reach out to a lost world, but at the same time, not neglect the fact that we have brothers and sisters uh, in faith that are doing life, that need to be discipled, encouraged, spurred on, gotten around. Lord, help us. Help us to know how to balance those two things. Lord, help us to know. God, how do we create a flock where you are comfortable to go find a lost sheep and to bring it back? because you know that this group of sheep are going to care for each other as well. Just help us to wrestle with those issues and those questions, Father. And Lord, in the next seven days as we go out from here, God, those of us in this room that know you, God, I pray, give us a chance. Lord, give us a chance to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God. Lord, lay on our hearts this week somebody. Who is it? There's somebody out there that doesn't know you that we can pray for. We can lift up before you, God, and we believe prayer makes a difference. So Lord, help us with that, Father. And give us those opportunities in these next seven days, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Uh